We are very excited to convene this, our third annual DDES Symposium in design research. We're growing very quickly, uh, beginning in year one with eight students. We're now up to 26, uh, beginning with 50 participants in this symposium in year one, where we've tripled that number at least. And the fact that it was established as an online program, that it was conceived as a, a, an experiment in education and design research to serve the greatest number uh, possible, even at, a, even at a remove, even at a geographic remove or a, a time zone remove, I think was prescient. And the, the future has come to meet us much faster than, than most of us anticipated as a result of the pandemic. But I do think that this, the format of the DDES program has made it accessible to many who might not otherwise have an opportunity to realize their, their dreams and to claim their expertise in the ways that they do in this program. It's astonishing, really. Uh, the, the, the depth of thought, the richness, the diversity of, of topics and endeavor. I want to recognize, uh, before we even begin, two people who are absolutely central to the, to the function and the spirit of the DDES program, and particularly for this symposium. Ashley Pearson, who is the program assistant for doctoral programs at the College of Design uh, is uh, an absolute stalwart. Uh, she takes on uh, new challenges uh, uncomplainingly and, and uh, performs beautifully. Uh, and she keeps us all going with great good spirits. Tracy Ryder, who organized this symposium and whose um, own research expertise uh, focuses on design and health has put together a really marvelous program. Uh, she is um, going to speak with you a little bit later on in the program and will be joining Associate Dean Sharon Joins for kind of valedictory comments at the at the very end. So we encourage you to to stick around. the uh, The panelists today will shine a light on the reciprocity between two groups of professionals, between healthcare providers and, and healthcare educators and designers who can also improve the science of, of uh, healthcare delivery and service. And both are focusing on healthcare outcomes by using design thinking in their own practices. These are user-centered and globally scaled interventions that we'll be talking about today. So to kick off the program, now it is my privilege to turn the, the floor over to Professor Tsailu Liu, the head of the Department of Industrial Design and Graphic Design, who will moderate the first panel. Thanks, Liu. Okay, thank you, Ellen. Uh, it's good to see everyone. Good morning. And I get to, I recognize a lot of names uh, in the audience, including some of my collaborators from Duke Medical School. Uh, welcome everyone. It's my honor to be the moderator of the first session. And uh, so I have been teaching and practicing design thinking and design making for many years. And uh, I think design thinking is a human experience centered, creative, iterative problem finding and problem solving process. And uh, design thinking has been very successful, being applied to various sectors of economy from products to build environment, from finance to retail, and from law to healthcare. And healthcare is one of the fastest growing and the largest industry in the United States. I think it's almost 20% of the GDP these days. And, uh, and design thinking can make a profound and significant differences uh, in healthcare. So I'm very excited to, uh, to have three distinguished healthcare uh, design thinking champions 
to the to the seminar this morning, and uh, I will introduce each of them. And after my introduction, they're gonna make a short presentation. After all of the three presentations, I will uh, I will moderate a Q and A session. So you know, put your question down, and uh, we will have we, you will have opportunity to ask these three experts uh, your questions. So first one I'm going to introduce is uh, Professor Jackie McLaughlin. And uh, she is uh, our own, she got two degrees from NC State. I do not know why NC State does not have the fortune to keep her, but she's working as an associate professor at the uh, pharmacy school at the UNC Chapel Hill, and one of the top pharmacy school in the country. And she's also the direct, director of the Center for Pharmacy Innovation in Education and research. So, okay, Jackie, welcome and uh, take it away. Thank you for the introduction and thank you all for having me here today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because I do have a couple of slides. So Ellen, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my slides? Yes, thank you for that. So, um, like the introduction mentioned, I am an associate professor at the UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and the director for CIFER, which is our Center for Innovative Pharmacy Education and Research. And I, I do think it's worth noting that I'm relatively new to the space of design. I do have two degrees in biomedical engineering, and I worked very briefly as an engineer before moving on to specialize in educational research. So those degrees from NC State are my bachelor's degree in engineering and my PhD in educational research. After I finished my PhD, I was hired at the UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy. And at that time, the school was embarking on what they called their educational renaissance. So they were completely redesigning their curriculum and they were interested in having someone at the school that could help them study their educational design and their new curriculum. And that's where I came in. So for those of you that are not in healthcare, um, you may or may not know that the health professions are rapidly evolving. Um, I think as mentioned earlier, we're in a very unique time in our history from a medical perspective. Um, but even prior to the pandemic, we were seeing very, uh, rapid changes in our practice models and the way that we care for patients in the healthcare system um, in medical education and pharmacy education in particular but in many of the other health professions we're also seeing a lot of changes in the way that we're training healthcare professionals um, and then there's been you know for many years a rapid increase in the amount of medical information and i would even argue the amount of medical disinformation that's available to the public to consume and to our, our trainees. And so these things have really complicated the way in which we approach training students and residents um, and the way in which I think we need to go about solving some really ill-defined and complex problems in our educational enterprise. So for me and, and my area of research and study, I think there are there are two buckets or two real opportunities um, that I'd like to, to really be engaged in helping advance. The first is thinking about design in the context of how we, we create our educational spaces. And I mean that in terms of our educational pedagogy and also I think the physical spaces in which we train students. And so I do a lot of work with faculty and staff and clinicians to think about how to best train students and residents for the healthcare workforce. Um, and when I ask them, when they come to me and they say, I have an idea, I wanna create this educational tool, or I wanna try this different way of training students, I find that they almost always start in the ideation phase of the process. Um, and so, I think for me, it suggests that as, a, as an educational community, we have an opportunity to step back and think differently about how we create those educational spaces for our trainees. Um, related to that, when I ask them about their inspiration or, or, or why they think that tool or that pedagogy or intervention will work, 
uh, they almost always talk about their own perspective and experiences. And I think, again, we have an opportunity to rethink who we put in the center of our design efforts when it comes to education. Um, you can imagine, for example, if the patient were the user of our educational enterprise, that might look really different in the way we think about the problems and think about the possible solutions we're facing than if we put the faculty as the user or the student as the user. So that not, that's not to say that one user is more important than another, but I think our tendency in education is to be very narrow in our problem solving and very narrow in how we define the challenges that we're facing. And based on my own experience working with educators, I think we have an opportunity to really expand the way we think about design in health professions education. So um, I've been working with colleagues in dentistry, uh, in design, in medicine, to try to think about how do we equip faculty in the health professions with these tools? How can we help them see the ways in which thinking about design can change their approach? And so we've started to publish in this space. We've started to provide training through workshops and retreats with faculty to try to help them um, take up some of these skills. And, and I'll just note that many of our educators are also practitioners. So I think a potential benefit of, of this is that they then take those tools into their practice settings, uh, their clinics, their hospitals, their pharmacies for us. Um, and really think about how they can use those activities or those approaches to improve their practice and ultimately improve patient outcomes. So that's one area I think when we, we think about our educators. The other area um, that I think we have a real opportunity to think about design in pharmacy education in particular, but in other professions as well, is teaching our students how to use and think about the challenges they're facing from a design perspective. So using those design tools. In the health professions, we generally teach two frameworks for problem solving. One is the scientific method. It's the most common and it's the one that most of our prospective healthcare providers come in with out of their undergraduate education is that kind of thinking about problems. Most of our professional programs spend a lot of time also focusing on clinical reasoning frameworks or clinical decision making models. So most of our students are using these two problem solving frameworks, scientific method and clinical decision making models. I think many of the problems that our students and trainees are facing when they go out into healthcare uh, just can't be addressed by these two frameworks. I think they're facing problems that require maybe a different way of looking at uh, challenges, at looking at problems, and a different set of uh, tools to potentially solve those challenges. So I think we have a real opportunity to equip our students with some of the um, ways of thinking about problems and approaching problems that um, these two models just don't address. Some of my colleagues and I, we, we actually did a review. This was a small study funded by the University of North Carolina, um, just looking at how much had been done in this space. So we went to the research, we went to the literature, we wanted to know how many research studies actually described teaching design thinking to health professions students or used design thinking explicitly as a framework for solving problems in health professions education. We did this review in 2018. We searched all the way back to 1979 and we found only 15 studies. And those studies started in 2009. So there was nothing prior to 2009 that really described teaching this framework or using explicitly this framework for uh, solving problems in health professions education. More than half of those 15 articles um, really didn't even spend a lot of time talking about design thinking or they were just commentaries. Um, only seven of those articles really delved into design as a way of thinking about problem solving. And only two of those seven explicitly taught the framework to the participants of the study. So at that time, when we did that search, there just was very little in the literature about this. 
Um, so I, I think for us, it signified that there's a real opportunity to think about not just should we teach students design thinking, but how do we do that in the health professions? What does it look like if we were to try to equip our students with these skills so that they're ready to face some of the really complex and challenging problems they're gonna see when they get out into the healthcare workforce? So that's it for me, just those kind of two ideas and two ways in which I'm trying to approach this and better understand how we can uh, change our thinking uh, add on and build on and expand the ways in which we're approaching problems in the health professions um, and how to really do that at the start of the training model in the professions um, within our degree programs. So on the slide here, I just have a couple of references of some of the work that we're trying to disseminate, again, to, to raise awareness, to uh, provide resources to faculty and educators in the health professions about this so that we can build some capacity and get some more interest in thinking about ways to go about this. So thank you again for having me. Uh, I look forward to the session and I'm happy to answer any questions at any point. Okay, thank you, Jackie. And uh, so Jackie and I have been collaborating on a grant proposal. I was glad to see that some of the cultural design faculty members are the co-author of the uh, the article the, uh, that you 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 just presented, and uh, also at first I was a little surprised by you know hearing that uh, teaching design thinking in the pharmacy school. I heard a lot of things, but it was an, and then at the more I know about it, I think it makes more sense, and uh, so it was also it was an, another surprise to me that uh, I heard a few weeks ago that at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, in any given semester, there are probably 10, more than 10 faculty members teaching design thinking or design thinking related courses. And they do not even have a design school. And uh, it's not the case and she say we have a design, design school, but we are not offering as many design thinking courses as UNC here, uh, UNC Chapel here. That's very interesting. Okay, thanks again, Jackie. The next speaker, next presenter uh, is Dr. Matt Trowbridge. Mm -hmm. uh, he is associate professor of emergency medicine. So I hope, uh, anyway, I hope we, and none of us <laughs> need to go to see him. <laughs> in <the near> <laughs> but uh, uh, that's, that's pretty cool. And uh, at, uh, uh, he's an associate professor of uh, emergency medicine at the University of Virginia. Thanks for joining us. And also he's a co-director of the uh, uh, the medical design program at University of Virginia. And uh, we never met, but I think we are becoming friends. First of all, we have a similar okay. microphone. Look at how, there you go. how big a microphone is. Right. And the other thing is, he set up the, the design studio in the medical school. This, your studio looks like my studio. So <laughs> <I> can, <laughs> I'm very <clears> sorry. <throat> so, uh, so Matt, the floor is yours. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to start sharing my screen here. And... I'll get the thumbs up from you like we did before. All right, great. Okay, well, thank you so much. Yes, my name is Matt Trowbridge, uh, Associate Professor, University of Virginia School of Medicine, and I direct uh, what we call the, uh, the UVA Medical Design Program. And essentially what we do is very simple. We teach design thinking to medical students, although I would say uh, the aspiration is to go beyond that. We really think of ourselves as preparing to, uh, just like we heard in the previous speaker, there's so many different parts of the healthcare profession that can be engaged in this way. <clears throat> so uh, I, I know I'm uh, preaching to the crowd here, but the reason we focus on design thinking is that we believe it provides a really valuable and I would even dare to say necessary uh, framework for, um, for medical students, healthcare professionals to take on uh, human centered and systems based uh, challenges in healthcare and public health. We think it's a great way, a very efficient way of helping to generate necessary mindsets, uh, particularly things like uh, tolerance of ambiguity and things like that. Um, it also is a great introduction uh, to core design skills and tools. And I think it's really one of its biggest things is it just uh, if you by giving students this opportunity to run through things in this way, I think it gives them creative confidence, as David Kelly uh, would say. <clears throat> And essentially, we love, you know, the reason we launched this program was we kind of 
uh, we saw it as an opportunity for UVA and ourselves to kind of send a clear message to students that we kind of want. Uh, in fact, I, I would uh, dare say expect them uh, to kind of see themselves as taking on kind of wicked problems, you know, systems-based complex uh, problems in healthcare, <clears throat> excuse me, throughout their entire career. The way we do that uh, is, uh, and uh, you know, it's great to hear from the previous speaker about this innovation that I think is really necessary, um, kind of figuring out how to hone down uh, the whole thing that is designed into very tangible, very fast, you know, uh, sprint style exercises, experiences and workshops uh, and tools that help these students who have no time uh, to kind of try to jump in with us. And because med students, uh, as, as you'll hear, I'm sure from Vaughn and everyone else, um, they will only engage with you if they feel like they're actually making a difference. So you, you can't just talk about stuff. You've got to be actually doing things. But how to do that in a time constrained way is, is, is the educational challenge, but I think also part of the fun. So let me give you a jump right into a, a very specific example. So uh, like everyone here in May and June, uh, University of Virginia School of Medicine suddenly had to go virtual. And that meant that a lot of our fourth year med students suddenly couldn't be on the clinical wards anymore. So we had to stand up a, a whole bunch of virtual electives. And I raised my hand and said, sure, let's do it. And we made a five-day virtual design sprint, which I'd never done before, uh, on the issue of COVID-19. <clears throat> this happened in early June. We had 20 fourth-year med students uh, jump in with us. And it's really important to note that these act like only two of the students had actually taken my design course as first years. So these were really completely novice uh, students. And we, we, one of the things we have learned that makes a big difference is we, to that idea of making an impact, even if we don't actually get a lot of time to make tons of stuff, we always have a client. <clears throat> so we always have somebody at the core who is thinking about an issue day in, day out, and then our students uh, kind of focus on helping them bring a new understanding to their issues. In this case, it's my colleague, friend, and actually co-director of the, of the design program, uh, Dr. Deborah Vinton, who is the medical director of our emergency department here. So she's in charge of all the clinical operations uh, at the, and she's become very enamored with uh, design thinking first through her own business training. But she uh, jumped in to be our client. <clears throat> and essentially what she challenged us with was basically pretty basic. How might we improve the patient and provider experience in the emergency department at UVA during COVID-19? And there were a whole bunch of things that got generated but one of the really important topics that she asked us to think about was the issue of uh, personal protective equipment, PPE. And most specifically, it was this, I, as we were moving into an era where this wasn't just going to be a short flash in the pan experience, but we had to kind of get into living with PPE. She really wanted to have people think about um, how might we make that, what does it mean to do this as a chronic part, you know, an established long, long standing thing, particularly from a provider perspective. So a couple of our students took this on <clears throat> and here's, I'm giving you, these are their slides <laughs> and their presentation. So if you know from the Karate Kid, um, they went with the wax don, wax doff of donning and doffing uh, PPE. And uh, what you'll see is actually one of our artifacts, which is essentially we found it very helpful to give students, um, we let them change their own graphic identity, I, I promise Ellen, but, uh, we, but we give them a structure of telling them how to build, like if you only have five days, we help them work through day one, two, three, four, five, and they're essentially building out this pitch <clears throat> by following the different pieces and handing off their, just their thought process. So let me show you what I mean. So of course, the first thing we did was just have them do a very basic user journey map of Dump, jumping in, understanding what it's like to do a, has a provider has to deal with as they put on PPE. <clears throat> we just did like Google Slides, very basic stuff, letting them just uh, kind of think about all the different steps that a person has to do to try to successfully just get PPE done one time and figure out where the positive and negative emotions are in that little journey. You know, they came up with a whole bunch of things, but some of the things they came up with right away just on their own evaluation of this is the, the you know, the donning and doffing procedures, they, they read them are long, they're tedious, and they're actually not that intuitive sometimes. The checklist is heavily text-based. There's no visual aspect about it. <clears throat> also, they found that there was, they, they just had a suspicion that this idea of finding a coach who has to confirm you did it right seemed like a bottleneck. But there were a bunch of other things, but there was, those are some of the ones that really stood out to them. 
So then we asked them to do the classic analogous inspiration exercise. We thought, and the students had fun with this. Uh, you know, they thought about kind of what could you do? Infographic tutorials, airplane safety videos. Of course, they got into well, we should you know we should go with the TikTok dance video concept. You know, is there something there? Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, obviously this is human centered design. We took those uh, uh, kind of assumptions and brought them to user research. So we had them virtually interview a bunch of providers. We also uh, were able to uh, get uh, patients who had to use the emergency department frequently, um, ask them what they felt had changed during COVID and how the PPE experience was from their perspective. And they came up with one of the things we've really emphasized with our students is that more than their end idea, um, we really try to engender in our program this idea that it's again the the thinking along the way, the insights that they they come up with are probably going to be their most valuable product for the client, and so we really focus a lot on this. So we so they we 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 really have them we give them templates for talking about their insights and try to get them to name them with kind of punchy ideas and stuff. <clears throat> so for example, when they talk to providers, they kept finding that for all these protocols, there's these things like there's an exposed area on the back of your neck that. <clears throat> Kind of, if you're doing this over and over, and you're really worried about bringing, you know, uh, infection to, uh, back to your family and friends, uh, that felt there was like this these kind of gaps in the PPE. Uh, they also noted like contaminated shoes were a big thing. There were even some providers that kind of had a, a work car <laughs> where they would kind of shed their stuff, and you know, that's obviously not an, a, a very extensible or a scalable solution. But that was the kind of thing that was going on in these providers. <clears throat> they also start as we started as the physicians started getting more comfortable. They were, when they were honest, they said they were starting to get a little cocky. Um, you know, they can, uh, but at the same time, they were very aware that they were worried that in that speed and getting more reg routine, that maybe they might miss something really basic. You know, for example, like we heard, like they were just forgetting like something silly that you think you would not forget, like putting on the goggles that it actually, if that happens, you're immediately quarantined if you go into it. So we were losing like 20 ICU nurses because of something simple like that. Or forgetting that bleach wipes can leave you stranded in a room while you wait. Um, it also was clear that when the small change in the protocol happened, it was all text-based and it was really hard to know what had changed in the procedure because it was all just text. Um, and then there was just this cumulative mental tax that everybody talked about of just, it's just exhausting uh, to keep always having to do this over and over. So from there, they, we took these ideas and let them do some prototypes, which we always refer to them as sacrificial concepts, like uh, to try to not have them be too overly wed to any one particular idea. Um, but some of the fun things that this group came up with, they came up with this idea of having like mirrors in the hallway that had kind of the most basic aspects of the PPE thing, the goggles and stuff kind of printed on it. Um, so that you could just, as a final hat, last check, you could just stand in front of the mirror and make sure you got all your basic things. To address the back of your neck thing, they also said maybe we could put one of those rear view cam mirrors <laughs> that you could check behind you and make sure you hadn't made something a dumb mistake behind you. Um, they also had this idea of rebranding that kind of necessary few minutes where you're washing and stuff that maybe we could rebrand it as a moment for meditation or something like that uh, for that, that kind of cumulative mental tax part. Um, they said, well, we got to gamify this. So like, Physicians, nurses, pharmacists are all very competitive people. So, you know, there should be some sort of way of gamifying like perfect PPE performance in some form. Um, and they also had some more outrageous ideas like the uh, Don auto donner uh, where you could just, you know, jump in. But it actually generated some interesting things about things like even like that shoe concept of uh, for dealing with things like the contaminated shoe problem. So overall, it was it was a really successful sprint and the client was thrilled. Um, from here, kind of like you heard from the other speakers, I think we, we are excited to actually just lean into virtual. Um, we feel like we're, we're, we're rapidly trying to develop workshops for, this is our first experience working with more uh, experienced students. Most of our students are at first years, so that was exciting and we're continuing to build that out. Uh, we're leaning into virtual, as I said, trying to come up with more flipped classroom models uh, that I think will probably extend beyond the COVID. And honestly, for this crowd, uh, whether you're in the program or these my fellow speakers, uh, our vision, it's how we'd like to contribute because I know we're not the only ones doing this, to some sort of open source kind of health design thinking resources because I think there's a lot there and I want to be part of it. So thank you so much. Um, please join us and reach out. We'd love to talk with you. The students really are amazing. So uh, we, we'd love to join with, with you in any way we can. So thanks so much. Really appreciate the time.
Thank you very much, Matt. It was fascinating. And I wish I had a mirror. I need a mirror like that in my house before I leave the house. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I think uh, it's very interesting. I think you guys did a very good job. Usually, from the very beginning, I mentioned that design thinking should be a uh, human experience center, not just human center, human experience center. And, and your students pay attention to not just physical experience, but uh, psychological, mental experience. That's really a key to the success of design thinking. That's wonderful, thank you so much. And the next up is Dr. Bong Ku. And uh, just be honest with you, Bong, Dr. Bong Ku is a rock star. <laughs> his his, his, uh, his uh, uh, talk, uh, his talk presentation was reviewed by many, many people. And uh, I actually used one of his talk in my lecture on my design thinking class. So uh, uh, Dr. Ku, is a professor of, again, emergency medicine. <laughs> I don't know why, but uh, not an emergency doctor. And uh, uh, Dr. Ku works at uh, Thomas Jefferson University. And he's also assistant dean of his college uh, for health and design. And uh, he is also the director of health design lab. Again, on top of that, he's a co-author of this beautiful book. I have to show you this book. And uh, he co-wrote this book with, uh, uh, with Ellen Lupton. She will be a, a, a speaker later on today. I, I, I really enjoy uh, reading the book. It's a beautiful book. And I think uh, not only uh, healthcare workers will love it, also designers love it because they got lots of pictures. Right? <laughs> the designers like pictures. <laughs> but one of the things I was, I was really impressed by oh, one of the statements uh, mentioned in the book uh, that healthcare should be a beautiful experience for patients, caregivers, and clinicians. That's spot on. I think that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful uh, statement. So, okay, without further ado, Dr. Ko, the floor is yours. All right, thank you for that intro. I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, let's see. All right, can you see that? Thumbs up? Great, okay. So uh, five years ago, I did something unusual. I started teaching design thinking to medical students, and this is not a normal thing to do. So we launched the first formal program teaching human-centered design to first-year medical students, and we follow them through four years of training. And in my 10 minutes here, I want to address three questions. Why should doctors learn to design? How do we actually teach design thinking to doctors and not only doctors, but to all health allied professionals, nurses, pharmacists, public health experts. And the last question is how can design actually help us get through this pandemic that we are experiencing? Design, I believe helps us to open our creative minds. And this is not only important for um, the arts and music and architecture and fashion, but I believe it's equally as important for medicine. Here you see us doing a design workshop for emergency medicine residents on improving bedside teaching. And it's a lot more fun than our traditional workshops that we do. Uh, this is me during my intern year of medical, medical of training. So this is after four years of med school. It's probably the uh, one of the few times I was actually smiling during training during my five years of postgraduate training. And one of the things that bothered me the most during medical training was that there was very few opportunities to engage my um, creative muscles medical training was a very anti-creative environment. So how do we actually teach medical students and doctors uh, to train? So five years ago, we started this uh, human-centered design program. And what we noted very early on was that we needed a safe space to experiment. We needed a space to give medical students and physicians a permission to fail. So what we did was we repurposed an abandoned space in our hospital. This happened to be in a bank vault. We drew inspiration for this space by visiting architecture studios, design firms, creative learning spaces all over the country. 
And the best way to describe our space is that it's like a test kitchen for the hospital. And some of the most innovative restaurants in the world have test kitchens. And they provide this safe space for chefs to create um, and fail and to come up with new ideas for dishes. In our test kitchen, what we do is we prototype products, devices, services, and experiences. We encourage the creative process and we give uh, doctors the permission to fail. So in our lab, these are some of the tools and materials that we use to develop these new recipes. They can be simple materials like what's found in this prototyping cart, and they could be more high-tech prototyping tools like 3D printers. We design with data from CT scans and MRI, MRI images. Um, here you see a, a anatomical model of a heart that we use to teach physicians to do echocardiography. Here's a 3D printed uh, uterus from an MRI scan. And here surgeons are using this as a tool to guide their operation so they avoid hitting fibroid tumors during a planned C-section. Uh, but sometimes design looks like this. Here is a, a storyboard that medical students use to reimagine the patient journey during an outpatient doctor's office visit. Here, participants use simple materials like paper and pen and Legos from that prototyping card to create a visual checklist that helps doctors remember to form the critical actions during managing a patient diagnosed with sepsis. On the right, you see participants in the design workshop reimagining the tray that holds a central venous catheter kit to make it in a more intuitive experience when they're opening up this kit. So we had all these new recipes for healthcare, but we lacked a cookbook to give to people who were curious about how they might create their own recipes at their hospitals and health systems. So later on, you'll be hearing from my co-author, Ellen Lupton. And this was a, an unusual and ex exciting partnership for us. Ellen is a designer and curator. I'm a emergency medicine physician who never wrote a book. And what we did was together, we wrote this cookbook on designing for healthcare. We explored how design can make humans healthier and in our book, we describe principles and methods that doctors and others can use to be more creative in medicine. And what this book ended up being for us was a field manual for creativity during the pandemic. And what I have seen is that every day, people all over the world have been designing solutions to this disease that we have never seen before. They've been improvising and hacking solutions to a virus that has upended the global economy. And prototyping has been a design method that we have used to um, get us through this pandemic. Um, early on in the pandemic, we were intubating patients with COVID pneumonia who were hypoxic. Then we found out, hmm, maybe we should just put them on their bellies and prone patients. And that helped us to avoid doing airway intubations. But it's not always comfortable for a patient to lie on his or her belly. So we tested out things like this pregnancy massage pillow to make it more comfortable for patients to be on their um, belly. We also tested out things like this airway box made out of plexiglass that was designed by a doctor in Taiwan. They're similar to the sneeze guards that you see in restaurants. Uh, during this procedure, it's an important for us to protect ourselves because this aerosolizes the coronavirus. In our design workshops, we use a lot of journey maps like this one. And what a journey map does, it helps the user experience a product, a service, a space over time. It gives us multiple layers of a user's experience. Uh, you can see an action taking place and you could see that emotional response to a situation. I've been asking our, myself a lot, what will be the new journey map for a patient in a post-pandemic world? 
COVID-19 has fundamentally changed the health journey map for patients and for clinicians. Uh, what we're seeing is that the patient journey map often begins with a digital experience. So a patient will have a telehealth appointment instead of physically going to a clinic. We have also been having to ask ourselves, how do we humanize this experience for patients? We have seen many patients dying alone in intensive care units uh, because of the risk of transmission for caregiver, for families and caregivers uh, that they cannot physically see their loved ones when they're in the hospital. So how, how can we change this journey in the future and reimagine it? We have been getting a lot of inspiration from design and hacks all over the world. On your right, you see a drive-through for COVID-19 testing in South Korea. They were one of the earliest countries to, so that's where my parents are currently living right now. And they've had a world-class response to COVID and, and they were able to test tens of thousands of people rapidly. And I believe some of this inspiration comes from drive-throughs for fast food restaurants. In the US, we have followed their creative lead. And here on the left, you see our um, mobile testing site, which is in a parking lot right across from my hospital. And on the left, you see an Airstream trailer that is operated by my lab. Uh, we were using this this past few years, taking out into the community and engaging with Philadelphians. And now we are using it as a base camp for our mobile COVID testing site this fall. We'll be taking out the trailer to underserved areas in Philadelphia that do not have uh, testing readily available. So I, I believe now more than perhaps more than any other time in the history of healthcare that we need to abandon our traditional mindsets in medicine and in public health. Design can give us doctors uh, a fresh mindset to help us embrace ambiguity and really give us a platform for creative problem solving during this uh, pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ku. It's very insightful and uh, I was really fascinated by the user journey map, uh, maps created by your students, medical students. And one thing is I mentioned that we've been collaborating with some uh, doctors in Duke and during this pandemic, it's really challenging to try to come out, create a user journey map virtually. And uh, you know, because people are not able to draw, not able to sketch. So that's something that we are still trying to uh, find a solution. And this, this kind of lead to a, a question, our Q&A &A session. So, so far, uh, certainly I think that we, this is open to all the audience, uh, everyone, but so far we have one question, it's kind of similar to the, uh, the situation we are right now. So the first question we receive is, uh, I think it's for all the panelists, what are your personal recommendations on how to proceed with brainstorming sessions? Because, because all, all, you know that all your teaching working with healthcare students, you, you involve brainstorming, it's a very impo important part of it, but how to conduct, how to proceed brainstorming in a virtual environment uh, during the pandemic, because this might be uh, gonna be, this kind of process gonna be with us for a while, not just after the next few months. So any suggestions? Maybe we, we, we follow the sequence of the presentation we start from Jackie, <laughs> and then we met and then Bob. And all the, all the other audience, you can start thinking of your questions. So you can either raise your hands or you can uh, just you know, type in your questions. Okay, Jackie? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to get us started and then pass it on. I, I will just say, based on some of the experiences that I've had uh, moderating or, or facilitating brainstorming sessions that um, there are some great tools already available, digital tools available that can help with this. So um, I don't think you have to start from scratch. I think there are a lot of great electronic tools that you can use um, to help facilitate some of the same types of activities we would do in person. Um, 
I also recommend, I guess, two kinds of guidelines. One is to, if you have a large group that you're working with, is to take advantage of breakout rooms or ways to get people engaged. So the risk, I think, in an online environment is that people can hide a little bit better. So using tools that really encourage engagement and ensure that everyone contributes, I think, can be really useful. Related to that, I think just orienting people and kind of letting them know some rules of engagement or ways to, to engage that might be helpful could also encourage um, you know, everyone to, to be involved. If, if it's a new environment for people, I think just trying to normalize it and remove some of the stigma associated with engaging online can be really helpful for uh, making people more comfortable in that kind of space. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Matt? Yeah, I agree with everything Jackie said. I mean, I think it really does depend on the scenario because, um, you know, if you're teaching a class like we did where it's like a five day, you know, swarm event where, or an afternoon where you're bringing people together for one second and it's going to be like an ephemeral moment. <clears throat> well, that's one thing in that kind of scenario. And actually this was the decision we made. We went for the tool that had no friction. <laughs> so we went with Google slides, you know, we just literally just like, literally make a slide. You can do it in literally 30 seconds, make a journey map with, don't worry about the design of it. And then just let everybody just go. Right. Now, if it's, uh, you know, like bonds, a uh, group, a uh, set of students that are going to be working together for four years. Um, well, then you can invest in learning things like these new, um, there's been an explosion of things like Miro and Mural, uh, these online uh, whiteboard apps, which I've found to be really fun and great. You do have a learning curve and you can get kind of lost if you, if you can spend an hour or 45 minutes getting people into the tool. So I'd be careful about that. But I think there's, um, I, I, I can see that Jackie, I, you and I are going to work together because it's, uh, it's fun. Like I, I make all, that's what I do all the time. I make artifacts like that are, uh, I also believe that if you can create artifacts that structure thinking, they can be part of the teaching as well. And I think it also really helps to create an enduring, like I think students really don't like it when they just do something really intense and there's nothing to show for it. And so one way to do that is just literally work in Google Slides, have everybody work in different sections of the same deck, let it be messy. And then at the end of it though, you, the five different groups have generated 50 slides and ideas and you can hand that off somewhat formally to the client and they like it. <laughs> okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, Bong? Uh, yes, we, we've been using Mural a lot. Uh, we used it for our medical device program that actually we ran virtually. Uh, what I, I think is key for us is doing the research on understanding the problem. And that involves a lot of interviews with clinicians and patients um, and other caregivers. And what's been nice, actually, in some ways, it's been easier to conduct those interviews during the pandemic, because now you could just FaceTime with a busy anesthesiologist in the operating room. And so we've been seeing that a lot or Zooming. So those interviews with the end stakeholders have actually been easier for our students to do uh, during the research phase. Okay, great. I agree with uh, that. I definitely agree with that. Okay. Thank you. And also I saw a comment uh, in the chat uh, from Alan Lofton. I really like it. Uh, Alan think that uh, there are aspects of virtual collaboration that are even better than the old way because people have more equal opportunities uh, to participate. That's a very good point. So thanks for all the uh, great insights. So uh, I do not have any other questions right now. Oh, I have another one coming up. But before I go to the next one, <clears throat> I have a question from, from myself. You know, we, I'm, you know, being a moderator, we are supposed to prepare some questions, but I have only one question that I have been teaching design thinking at law school, the you know, future lawyers. And uh, so these days, uh, this is one very important issue that uh, the, the legal profession is the access to justice. And uh, so I'm just curious that uh, for, for Jackie, <clears throat> so Jackie, Matt, and Bong, uh, the access to healthcare, especially for those uh, they're facing the challenges uh, in the financial challenges, maybe social uh, challenges, how we could uh, use design thinking to facilitate 
to in, enhance the access to healthcare. So maybe we still go to the same order, Jackie, Matt, and Bob. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I'm not actually a healthcare provider, so I don't want to overstep my bounds here, but um, I just want to touch, touch base on the slide I had about kind of the scientific method and the clinical decision-making model. And this question is exactly why I think human-centered design and design thinking are critical for our healthcare providers to understand. Uh, because clinical decision-making tends to be very individually oriented. It's specific to the patient and their, at least in pharmacy, their medication therapy. Um, and so in order to think about these larger issues around access, um, I, I think we have to uh, embrace other models of thinking about problems to really get us to a point where we're coming up with solutions that, that are creative and um, really help advance practice to improve patient care. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would actually, to be honest, my answer, I would actually quote Jackie. I, one of my favorite things I loved in your presentation was that idea of very early on where you talked about the idea of, um, you know, how do you get students to take on something like increasing access to healthcare? What, to your point, without something like design thinking, framing the conversation, what will tend to happen is people just start in the ideation phase, like you said, <clears throat> they'll just start talking from their own experience or talking at a very high level. Whereas I actually, I, I don't think you have to reinvent it. You just apply design thinking, which would basically tell you, great, well, what are 50 people, what are 50 extreme users we would need to identify and ideally talk to, to have the biggest uh, understanding at a, you know, yes, at each individual thing, but how, what are the, what are the key personas we need to develop to understand this issue? I think the other thing that I learned from designers over the years that has really helped me and I try to pass on to my students is um, I had a stu I had a designer kind of slap my hand figuratively early on when I, she kept saying, you know, we'd be working on something cool <clears throat> and like around maybe a school design issue or something like that. And she'd, I'd immediately flip to making it a, oh, that's so cool. We can do this across the nation. And she'd be like, no, no, that's not the way design really works best. Um, it's really great. Like design, my, my, my answer would be, um, how might we imp improve healthcare access in you know, a very specific neighborhood in Philadelphia? Or how might we, you know, in Charlottesville is gonna have completely different factors. Um, that's, I just feel like the answer is just do design thinking. <laughs> And, and uh, I, I love how designers are very empathetic and that is just a key ingredient for designers to be um, successful is to really understand the emotional and mental state of the end user. And during this journey, during the pandemic, uh, we have been seeing a disproportional impact upon patients with COVID who are black and brown in our country. And we've been seeing that they've been dying at much higher rates. I mean, in Philadelphia, we are a minority majority city. Uh, primarily this pandemic has devastated black and brown communities in Philadelphia. And I think it's important for us when we think about designing solutions and interventions that we understand the needs of some of our most vulnerable populations and and you know, one, one thing that I've learned is you know, how much of racism plays, plays, plays a, a critical role in worse health outcomes for black and brown communities. And you know, it, it affects everything from access to care, to testing, to uh, getting diagnosed, to getting treatment. And I think the more that we as a community of designers and healthcare professionals and educators can understand the role of racism in the pandemic, I think the better we are going to be able to come up with design inter interventions for, for these vulnerable populations in our country. Oh, that's great. Thank you. We got quite a few questions. Uh, I'm not sure we can cover all the questions. So if, if your questions do not get covered, sorry about that. We can try to, uh, uh, maybe address with us other uh, uh, opportunities. I saw a, a question from Glenn Johnson. Uh, 
it's interesting that Glenn is a industrial designer. He's a director of a, a, a company making airplane seats. <laughs> I'm really happy that Glenn, you are here. So Glenn's question is a little bit uh, different, change your direction. Where does a T person, T like T shape, right? The T person with deep medical and technical knowledge fit in the best. So <laughs> that's an interesting question. So maybe uh, Jackie, Actually, want to try to share your thoughts? Matt, go ahead. Well, I, 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 I raised my hand because I actually use that. I now I use that concept of the T, T uh, professional a lot um, with the idea of the, yeah, to your point, the kind of the trunk of the T is your, whatever your core competency is. And I always, um, particularly when I'm talking to a lot of designers, I always make sure to people understand I do not ever claim to have the skills of a designer. I think I'm very, what I, and I, and I try to engender that to my students too. I say, actually you're most useful to the team. If you really focus on your core competence of being a physician, but then the T is your ability to work across fields. And I think design thinking helps you to do that. So what I always say to my students is I'm actually, I, I'm trying to train you to become a world-class collaborator. Um, and I think that design thinking offers one of the best uh, kind of common language that you can learn fairly quickly that I've seen. So that's, I think the T-shaped concept is a great one to, to emphasize. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Bob, you want to uh, address that? That summed it up perfectly. Nothing more to add on that. Okay, that's great. That's great. So uh, a question, I found uh, a question from, uh, from Eric said, what was the impetus for generally traditional medical institution to embrace design thinking and open itself up to what they perceive as a risk in innovation? So that's, that's, a, that's a very good question, but uh, it might take a second to think about it. So yeah, Jackie, would you like to try? Okay. Yeah, yeah, so I can um, talk a little bit about our schools kind of uh, step into this space and, and um, it's really specific to us. So we actually have a, um, a donor who our school is named after, our namesake, Fred Eshelman, who has been very successful in the innovation and entrepreneurship space. And he has really invested in our school's development of, of innovation and entrepreneurship. And so it's generated a lot of conversation and interest for us specifically in that space, the E&I space. And as a result of that, I think as, as we've dug into what that looks like, it's put us into a design space. Now, not all of us you know, are comfortable in that space, right? So it's been a really interesting journey. Uh, but for us, I think in innovation, entrepreneurship um, is gonna be one way, I think, that we can continue to build capacity for thinking about design within um, pharmacy and the health professions. I, I think there are others as well. I, I don't think E and I should be the only driver of this, um, but at least for our school, that was a way to get our leadership kind of opened up to the idea that this is a space um, that's different from what we've traditionally done, but might help advance our practice. Uh, Matt? Uh, sure. I'll just say real quickly, uh, the, the honest answer is um, it doesn't usually come from the top down. <laughs> it's like, uh, bon and I have known each other a long time, and I can promise you a couple years ago, we weren't sitting here being like, uh, it, was, it was a lot more entrepreneurial. And it was just, I think the, uh, the commonality between any, any of people doing this work, particularly it, it's starting to gain steam. But um, it's just like somebody just decides, hey, this would be really great to offer. And you just start small. Um, a, a more specific and helpful answer <laughs> is uh, the sequence of arguments that I've found helpful if you are in that position like I am, where uh, I am frequently trying to explain to a more traditional uh, administration. Um, and I don't mean that in any sort of derogatory way. It's just they're, they're, they have their mandate that they feel they're doing a great job at. Um, what I basically say is design thinking, that's part of why I leveraged it, is because it's so well established. Um, instead of coming in and saying, we're going to do design in med school, uh, instead, what I tend to say is, would you agree that the biggest challenges facing healthcare and public health right now are not going to be solved by traditional methods? Yes. 
great. Okay. Do we have an existing pedagogy within medical school that deals with those very well? No. Okay. So should we find one? Yes. Do you know one? I do. In fact, it's called design thinking and it's been taught not just, it's not new in business schools. In fact, they're doing 10, 15 year retrospectives on it. It's not scary. It's been done a lot and it's really effective. You know what's weird? What? We're not doing it at all in medical school. And they're like, oh my gosh, well, we should get going. I'm like, I know we should. And I found that to be really successful. And it also, is, it, 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 you can see with Jackie, it's also nice because if you choose something like design thinking, because it's so well established, and I know designers sometimes find it's a little bit too reductive. The reality is that reductiveness, <laughs> if that's such a word, um, actually helps a lot if you have a researcher like Jackie or myself, because it's just, it's a package I can slide across the table. So that's what I found to be really helpful. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, the project I've been collaborating with Jackie is about to do some research on the pedagogy of design thinking, because uh, there, as mentioned earlier, there are many different institutions, many different disciplines, disciplines that teach design thinking, and they, they are all doing very differently. And uh, so sometimes they got the, 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 there are a lot of common grounds, but there are a lot of things they do with this so uh, uh, interestingly. So uh, actually design thinking itself is, is a relatively new notion. It's less than 100 years uh, compared to history, it's compared to sociology, it's relatively new discipline. And uh, just being honest with you, I think we are still building the theoretical framework for design thinking. And, uh, and also not to mention the pedagogy of design thinking. We still have a long way to go, but we are really excited to see uh, people from many different disciplines to contribute to this conversation, to uh, contribute to, to, to this uh, establishment that we are working on. So, uh, Bon, do you have thoughts? Yeah, just, just quickly to add, I, I, I think there's some magic that happens when you can merge a creative mindset with the traditional scientific mindset and the blending of creativity and research is, is important. So I don't know what you call that. You can call it design thinking or innovation or entrepreneurship. I don't really care. Uh, I think, you know, we're trying to figure out what that is, but I, I think what we do understand is that the problems in healthcare are so complex and every medical school and healthcare institution is trying to figure this out and it's being, um, and we're seeing that during this pandemic, right? We, in six to eight weeks, we can end it. We, we have the technology to do that. Contact tracing, mask wearing, social distancing, but we're banking on a vaccine to uh, end this pandemic. And it's, it's hard. And I think what we need to do, I mean, we have the research, we, we know what we need to do, but often we don't know how to get there. And I, and I think to me, that was appealing about design. It helps me think about that better future state. And I can get a little bit of a roadmap of how to get there. And I think that's a power of what um, designers can do. And often we, in healthcare, we're so bound by the problems, they seem so overwhelming and we can't think of that better future state. Um, so I think what we're gonna see during this after this pandemic, I think there's gonna be a fundamental redesign of how healthcare delivery is going to operate. And I think it's a tremendous time for a design to elevate its role in an industry that traditionally has not embraced it. Uh, that's, that's a wonderful point. And I also saw Alan Lofton's question at here at the culture design in my department, for example, uh, the graphic design students, and industrial design students have been collaborating with the healthcare providers uh, in Duke and UNC. So Jackie has been working with our faculty and uh, my, uh, just in the summer during the pandemic, I'm, uh, I am working with probably five, six students. Uh, they're working with the Duke Medical School. So there's a lot of interaction and uh, uh, collaboration, but I think we need more uh, for, uh, I think the one good thing about this seminar is a lot of time the design students, they just feel like, oh, I do not know too much about healthcare. They're a little bit uh, uh, nervous about coll collaboration with the medical uh, providers, but actually there are, there are tremendous opportunities uh, for collaboration. Uh, so, so, so that I would encourage our design students here, many of them are doctoral students to rethink about this. And uh, you know, as, as the department head, I talk to the parents all the time. One of the concerns from parents that, hey, I, if, my, if I send my daughters and sons here, 
uh, would uh, after school uh, they get a job would their job be replaced uh, would go uh, would fly people overseas and uh, I said yes yeah, some of be honest with you some of the uh, the jobs got replaced by the position for other countries but healthcare this area is not going to be easily replaced because this is very human centered we very, very culture very uh, context centered so so the, I really encourage uh, the design students to think to explore uh, the possibilities in healthcare so we still got uh, I think we still got a few more minutes I can there's a question I like to uh, to to uh, to ask the panelists from the audience uh, this is the question is what aspects that you feel are the still required to be addressed by the educators and practitioners for the future of the design health interaction? I think this is a very good question. So Jackie's been nodding. So Jackie, you have some thoughts. Mm -hmm. Let's go, let's, you go first. <laughs> so I'm going to give an example specific to the, the design thinking framework, but I think there are a lot of ways to answer this question. I, I found in my own work and in my own personal experience that where, um, educators and maybe faculty in the health professions tend to struggle when we do design work is separating convergent and divergent thinking. Um, when health professionals make decisions, it's processing a lot of information and it's very quick, sequential, convergent, divergent, back and forth constantly in the decision-making process. So when I sit down with a group of educators or a group of students and I ask them to separate those two things, it is not natural at all. It is very difficult for them to do. And I've actually learned that um, you have to really kind of warm them up to it and help them see when they actually are diverging and kind of stop it and help them, you know, kind of raise their own self-awareness about how to separate those two thinking processes. Uh, because it really stifles the creativity if they can't just let go and really brainstorm and be creative. And so for me, I think at least in the stages that I've worked through with, with different educators and students and myself, that's an area where in the health professions, we, we've got to learn how to do. It's just not natural. And there's a lot of stigma around failure for good reasons in the health professions because the types of decisions they're making are really critical to patient care. And so also kind of helping them understand um, how and when to fail and what that looks like in the context text of design can be really helpful. Uh, Matt, okay. Oh, sure. I mean, I would completely agree with everything Jackie said. I mean, one of my jokes in my, in my, I actually use the metaphor of um, a Swiss army knife. You know, it's like, hey, um, don't worry. You're going, you, welcome to UVA medical school. We're going to train you. you. You are going to be first and foremost, a world-class clinician you know, um, great. Uh, and so if you take the ER setting, for example, I always joke like, now remember, I'm going to teach you design thinking. It's kind of like a different tool you can take out of your Swiss Army knife. But if you get called to a code uh, in the ER, like don't, no, po no, no Sharpies and Post-its, please. Like let, that's a time for just run the code. It does, you know, so like, and that's, we're going to be really, really good at that. But then there are moments, and it could be a 10-second design exercise you do in the course of a, of a patient interaction or a two-month exercise. We're just giving you a different way of, of flipping out a different way of thinking about things. So I think that that concept is, is really important. Um, my little add-on would be actually to flag a, a comment that Ellen Lupton threw into the chat about um, kind of bringing in graphic designers and industrial designers and so forth as a linkage. So I think that linkage and making that, because right now it's like, it really takes, it, you have no idea how hard Bon has worked to get to the point now where he's got these relationships, these partnerships. I'm working on, I'm, I'm a couple years behind him and like making those things happen because it's very frustrating to the students. What, we, what I can do, what they can do is that pre-processing part, the design thinking part, that's not hard. You do need to, there needs to be a very fluid and established way to roll that expertise. We have the, we can get access to patients and physicians much easier than an industrial design student can. But once I've made my little hack job of a, of a worksheet, I need an Ellen Lupton. I, I would love to have Ellen Lupton, but I just graphic designers or industrial designers to take it from there as an incredible input for their work. I think that's really a future of this stuff. And the best schools will learn how to integrate that handoff and it'll be constantly happening all the time. 
the, and the only thing I want to add on to that, Matt, is you know that designers and clinicians and researchers uh, co-design studies together and publish together. That we yes. really want to measure the our design intent, look at outcomes, and see if the design process works, and and publish in peer-reviewed journals. And 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 to add on as well, just this the communication that there is an opportunity for designers to work with the medical community around uh, the dissemination of scientific information. And what we're seeing during this pandemic is a lot of misinformation and disinformation, and how can we work together uh, and communicate to the public of what is sound science. And um, yeah, so those the are the only two things I want to add. Okay. Uh that's great. That's, that's great. So I think we have only two minutes left, but I, uh, one quick question that I think all three of you could cover uh, that in a short minute. Uh, so the question is, how have your students responded to your programs? So yeah, because they, they might be very different from what they thought. So what, what they think uh, before or after the program? Uh, Jack, you'd like to go first? Sure. So um, for reasons I just mentioned in the previous question, you know, there is sometimes um, a bit of a struggle because design can feel very abstract compared to other ways that students are learning within a health professions curriculum. Um, we do have some programs that are interprofessional. And I think to the earlier points, um, having other professions like uh, business, potentially social work, public health, uh, medicine, pharmacy, and others involved in the design process can really help students see beyond just what their specific training is um, to help kind of show the relevance of why this kind of approach can be really useful. Uh, I'll jump in. I mean, one thing is, you know, what one of the reasons I'm starting to get a little more traction within the School of Medicine is we're actually starting to have students show up um, for their interviews at UVA School of Medicine asking about the medical design program <laughs> and saying that it's actually places like Jefferson, you know, Jeff Design, places that are offering these things. There's actually, there's a subset of students that I think are actually some of the top students are coming in and asking, they want this out of a, of a medical school program. So that's pretty interesting. That's new, but it is happening. And then on the flip side, the outcomes of these things that are exciting are, um, but I, I feel an urgency to help these students. They finish these types of experiences and you can't unthink that way. So now they want to have their whole career this way. And it's a little, I don't have great answers for them yet other than like, well, maybe Bond has another spot in a residency program, but you know, um, you know, it's, we've got to have more places for these, for these students to go. And what, what is the next phases of their career? Um, that's, that's what's coming next. I, I will put a big, a huge precedent is um, Dr. Bonku becoming an endowed professor of medicine and design. Um, that is a huge accomplishment. It's amazing, but it also is like, I'm so excited, not just for him, but for maybe me uh, and others, because it sets a precedent that there is such a thing. Like Jackie should be one of those, I think, you know? Um, but it's like, we have to, those are the things like, how do you become, a, you have to make it through the promotion and tenure process. You have to have a career. We, we have to define those together. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. I think all the medical schools should have a person, I have a uh, faculty member like Bong, right? So Bong, you have the last word to say. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, that there is a hunger among healthcare professionals and medical students and allied health professionals to engage the creative part of who they are. And historically, the pedagogy in medicine has not allowed for that. And, you know, in medicine, we're, we're the most type A anal people on the planet, and we don't embrace ambiguity. And I think what design does is help us to embrace the ambiguity that comes in these really hard problems that we're facing and helps us to be more creative when thinking about solutions. Good, uh, thank you very much. So we are very sorry that we are at the end of our time, uh, but I really appreciate the, 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 the generous time that you, uh, panelists uh, share with us. So everybody just give uh, this panelists a big round of applause. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. And uh, we have to move on to the next program. And uh, I'm going to introduce the next presenter, uh, uh, Leslie Ann No. Uh, she's a very proud of uh, <laughs> alumni of culture design. She received her PhD in design from culture design at NC State. And I remember the day I was, I was her major professor. I remember uh, how proud I was to put the hood on her <laughs> shoulder on uh, the day she graduated. And then she, uh, she has been teaching at uh, uh, the D school at Stanford uh, as a teaching fellow. Uh, she has, I think uh, it was a year, but she's still teaching while remotely. And also right now she's associate director of design thinking for social impact at Tulane University in New Orleans. She also created this uh, uh, designer's critical card. So I think today, Leslie Ann gonna talk a little bit about this, right? And uh, so, yeah, Leslie, Leslie Ann, please take over. Thank you, Lou. Um, I'm gonna start sharing my screen and I don't actually have an opening slide. I'm just gonna throw you all into the presentation. Uh, all right, and let me go into presenter mode. Okay, so I just like within the last five minutes changed the order of my slides um, based on um, based on a comment that Bonku made uh, about designers and medical professionals publishing more together. And um, this was actually going to be my last slide, but this is now my first slide where um, recently myself, um, so I'm Leslie Ann Noel, of course, and my colleague, um, Dr. Bassano at Tulane University, we received a PCORI award. So that's Eugene Washington Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Um, we received this award to use equity focused design thinking to improve community participation in uh, public health research against COVID. And um, so maybe this is, you know, like just ending off where um, Bonku was saying we need to publish together. For me, like this is a really exciting time um, because I'm gonna start something like this. And um, I agree that we do need to be doing a lot more research together. But that wasn't where I was initially going to start. Where I was going to start actually was May 25th, um, 2020 which was Memorial Day. And um, I was in California at the time I had run away from New Orleans. Um, I was hiding from COVID. And um, I'm gonna start a timer, yes. Um, the thing is someone sent me this um, clip with Amy Cooper and Christian Cooper, um, their interaction in Central Park. And that really, really, really made me angry. I was angry for actually days. So that was the same day that George Floyd was murdered. But I actually didn't see the George Floyd incident until a few days later because I was so angry about the first incident. Um, I'm going to tie this to the cards, believe it or not, um, because like two weeks later, I was back in New Orleans and then I was still angry, you know, angry about um, the George Floyd inc incident, angry about the Coopers um, incident. And then I posted my cards on LinkedIn um, and shared really that the cards actually were also born out of a, um, a place of, of some level of anger. And it was that they were born at a time where I was either participating in or eavesdropping on conversations where I felt that there was just an assumption that people had to assimilate or fit in um, to be able to contribute to conversations, you know? And actually there was a specific conversation that I recall from that time where I started off saying that I came to the problem space as a black woman from the Caribbean, and this is the lens that I bring to the, to the problem. Um, but actually I didn't even get to finish my sentence because somebody interrupted me and said, no, 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 hang on, hang on, we're all American here. And the funny thing is that, okay, obviously I'm not American. Um, you can hear that in my accent. And then the even funnier thing is that the person who was saying this was also not American. Um, but I just was struck at that time how, you know, we were there in Silicon Valley having these conversations. 
and there was that pressure or assumption for people to, to fit in. And so that pressure made my colleague, who was not American, feel that he had to say he was American and then feel that he had to tell me, well, OK, you're American, too, which I'm not. And then that's how we would get to a solution of the problem. So at that point, I started to um, listen a lot more in these conversations. You know, I mean, take my little bit of anger and I listened a little, little bit more and I started to write down um, concepts that I thought could have helped the conversation better, okay? So like, you know, my colleague didn't think that he had to present himself as American to fit in. He should have been able to dig into his own identity um, to understand that, you know, we bring these lenses to the work that we're doing. Or, um, you know, I started to think about all of these different concepts of critical theory or critical concepts that could improve the conversations that, um, that we were having at the time. And I started to write everything down, okay? Um, so like we'd be talking about language and maybe we were designing something and I would hear people within the group were assuming that everyone spoke English. And then I thought, okay, you know, I'd write down a little concept and say, well, okay, as designers, we need to remember that not everyone speaks English or even to remember that maybe not everyone has the same reading level. And as I was making these notes, the alphabet actually started to build itself. And I was creating this alphabet then to introduce some critical theory and then a question below that made this theory relevant to our practice as designers or as design students. So I'm going to share some of the concepts in the cards. Um, the first card starts with positionality. Um, as Lou said, I'm a proud alumna of um, NC State and the College of Design, and I learned in my qualitative research methods class with Tiffany Davis and, um, and a different class um, with Tracy Ryder. Um, I learned about positionality and how, you know, in qualitative research, we have to um, delineate our own identities and our biases and, and make it clear or reflect on how these identities come into the work that we do. So this is like one of the cards that's in the deck, you know, and everything for me, actually all of my classes now start with a reflection on positionality. And of course, um, positionality then makes us realize then that there is actually no object Activity and we bring our identities with us. And so like, this is another kind of discussion that I have in my class, you know, where we challenge the notion of objectivity and try to understand, okay, where really do our personalities and our identities affect how we view objectivity, you know, what we think is objective. Another card here, this is um, assimilation right, which is really like the scenario that I found myself in, in that conversation where there was the expectation that I had to assimilate um, to be part of this conversation, you know, and so that's something that we have to think about as designers, you know, where we have to recognize that really the assumption that people will assimilate um, is probably not uh, the best assumption that will lead to good product design, okay? And then another card here, this is self-awareness, uh, which is about really being more reflective um, to understand like how we affect the work that we are involved in. Um, this I, f I, I sometimes find, you know, I've been a designer for a long time and I recognize as well, um, in some cases, my own lack of self-awareness. So like these are conversations that I'm, trying to have more with designers to see, well, okay, are we actually aware of the spaces that we are in and how we affect the conversations that happen around us? And then, um, so eventually I decided on a deck of 26 letters. Um, I've actually since expanded to 29 letters. Um, some letters had many, many concepts um, that I wanted people to think about, but I only chose one or two. So for example, the letter A had also um, ableism and ageism, and these cards have never been printed because you know I, I, I had to be a little bit reductionist and choose um, 
a specific number of cards for the deck, you know, and some letters were actually like a force fit. Um, like J was surprisingly difficult to find something for as well as K. Um, so here's an image of the complete set. And actually it's been a scrappy project, which is probably like a good example of design thinking where um, this is actually the first photograph that I took of the complete set. And it's the only photograph that I've ever taken, you know, and as soon as I created the set, um, I, I put it on Etsy as a prototype so that my friend at UC Davis could buy, um, could get the deck from me. And, you know, many, many, many sales later, it's actually that same listing of the prototype that, that people are buying from. So it's like really scrappy and continues to be scrappy. And I'm glad that people have bought, um, have bought into this project with me. So people keep asking me how to use the deck. And um, I know what I designed it for. Um, and I'll first I'll share with you. So I designed it at first as like a reflection tool for um, a designer because we don't get this kind of critical language generally in design education, right? So for a designer to be able to, to take on some critical language um, and learn to ask these questions for themselves. And then I play um, with my students some memory games. Well, we did this in face-to-face -face mode where we would play memory matching games um, so again, they would learn or be introduced to a lot of theory in a very short space of time. My friend, Michelle Washington, who's a professor at um, FIT, she sent me this image actually just a couple of days ago where her students were using these cards um, as a kind of pivot point for their research. So she would help them to frame their ideas or change their ideas um, in that way. And then my colleague Halcyon um, Lawrence, who's a professor at Towson University, um, she has a writing group with friends, her colleagues from law um, and technical, scientific, and health writing. And they've used these to frame exercises for students, right? I don't actually know how everybody's using them, but um, I wanted to. I've been throwing the, um, the idea out to people that the deck is not supposed to be the be all or end all. You know, it's actually like, this is the start of a conversation. So, you know, I came up with a deck, but I'm hoping that other people will continue building on it and building on the ideas and sending me um, alternative letters um, to consider to add to the deck. So, um, so the deck is just an, introdu um, an introduction and an invitation to discussions about critical theory. And that's my 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Leslie, and it's a fantastic uh, project. So uh, as in the chat, there are some people asking how they can purchase a set of this. And uh, I think they, in the chat, there are uh, answers for that question. But also there's a question uh, uh, in the Q&A uh, session that it says the project is phenomenal, but, uh, but uh, uh, he would like to uh, have, is that available, have a digital version? Is that a digital version available? Um, I haven't worked out the logistics. <laughs> so the, the, the scrappy project idea continues where like every week someone will talk to me and say, well, how about we try doing this? Or how about we try doing that? Um, and actually this is not my full-time job. So, so um, it has not become available because you know, it's, it's something that I'm doing in between other things as well. And um, I mean, I'm always open to conversations. You know, if someone wants to reach out to me and help me figure this out, I'm more than open to this. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people give, which, is, which means this is very inspiring. People uh, uh, have ideas out of this, uh, uh, from project, but I was when 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 you were talking, I was thinking that this could be a, some sort of car developed for medical schools, right? So medical school students, I think, with similar approach, they might they might uh, learn a lot. They might have a set of tools uh, in their toolbox. So yeah, sending another project maybe for 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 uh, Doctor Trowbridge or Doctor Cool. <laughs> Yeah, and actually, like our grant at Tulane is, um, it's, it's not a 
directly related to these cards, but we're trying to figure out how to, um, how to really understand patient needs. Um, and then we're gonna design a toolkit that other medical professionals can use. So, I mean, it may end up looking similar to these cards, but the idea is that we're gonna design tools to help uh, medical professionals really understand the needs of patients um, in this COVID environment. So yeah, you should see something soon. I think Matt is playing with some cards, right? Do we have something similar? <laughs> well, I've been looking forward to hearing about uh, this presentation. Um, so it also links to an earlier a com question about how do you war do warm-ups? How do you get students to quickly in? Um, I'm a big fan of, uh, of, they were developed by Liz Gerber. Um, they're called the mock-ups cards. Um, if you don't know what these are, but you basically, you grab a, you grab a, a, a user and a challenge they have, and then a constraint. And basically I have my med students grab those things and then you give them one minute and they have to come up with as many ideas, draw as many ways that that could be solved as possible. And the, the fun part is that they're ridiculous. It will be like, you know, farmers that need a way to transport vegetables that's minty fresh you know or whatever and they go you know and everybody ah, i don't know how to do that and so those things can be fun what i love about where you've taken us is um that card idea that obviously brings up in incredibly you know it, it uh, you know poignant and critical topics and i there is something about the tan i i would caution people about digital is fine but actually the tangible is is that idea of card sort and stuff in um where you, you, you can place them down and step away and let people tangibly organize a conversation the way they want to, um, that I think is really important. So well done. I, I, I will definitely be purchasing a, 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 at least one set. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's, an, there's another deck that, um, that is actually not available commercially that I am really inspired by, which is by The Thing from the Future by Stuart Candy, uh -huh. which is similar to that what deck by Liz Jubel, where it sends you into a future space where you have to imagine. Um, it could be like, there is a card actually about medicine. So like, um, it's a person, a verb, a medicine, and, and a thing. Um, but it, it is definitely a future thing. So I really like the tangible nature of card decks, and I haven't figured out how to recreate it um, virtually. I've used the deck on Mural and my friend Michelle um, Washington has used it on Miro, but to me it's not the same experience. Well, I am trying, by the way, if whoever wants to collaborate with me, I, I have tried my own mock-up version for patients and stuff where it has like healthcare type scenarios, but then tries to add in some of that, so the, that idea of like throwing conversations out in front. So uh, I do think there's a there's some sort of a healthcare version of this or a public health version. So we need lots of these things, I think is the point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Matt, good news for you. Alan would like to help you with that. So. <laughs> well, I finally happened. I finally got Alan to say, yeah, that's what we're going to do together. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Matt, I, that's very, I'm very impressed by what you've been doing. And also I think, uh, yeah, if I think I see the potential for you to get a, graphic design or industrial design degree, we'd be happy to have you here as our student. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> okay. And, uh, so any other questions for, uh, for Leslie Ann? And I just want to acknowledge my colleague, um, Alessandra Bassano, who, who put a comment in the chat. Um, so she is the rock star public health um, professional at Tulane who has been working with, with design thinking for quite some time already. Um, I just arrived at Tulane, but she was already working um, in design thinking before I got there. Yes. I'm really glad you mentioned that. I'm just going to jump in here because I want to have this conversation. There's a, there's a marked difference between the way Leslie Ann talks about design, the way that design educators talk about design, and the way that health educators talk about design. And I'm hearing it. And uh, in uh, Alexandra's comment, she said, this can and should look different than when design is for commercial products and services. And I wonder if the panel could take that up. So I think that um, what, uh, this may not quite respond to your question, Ellen, but I, this is something that I think about, you know, like what, what do I bring to this project, right? So Alessandra is, 
very um, methodical. You know, I had to apologize to Alessandra the other day, and I, you know, that okay, you're doing the heavy lifting and the writing, but you know, I'm bringing a, um, maybe the divergent thinking. I, I didn't actually say this in our conversation, but you know, like I think Bonku referred to it earlier that you know we bring um, really different ways of solving problems. And I think that particularly in this COVID-19 experience that we're all in, that's something that comes up often, you know, that we really can't solve um, maybe existing problems with old methods. And, and maybe then, I, you know, I think that that's the value that as a designer, I bring to this kind of project, you know, that I am looking for inspiration from different places. Um, I'm trying to have different kinds of conversations um, that maybe the healthcare professional um, has. I'm trying to listen in a different way. So, you know, I'm really looking forward to that kind of collaboration. You know, I think that that's the skill that we bring in as designers. And um, I do hear the difference when, um, when I talk to my colleagues in business schools, for, for example. Um, I taught a class in a business school just this summer uh, um, again. And, you know, it's, it's always interesting to hear, like maybe in the design class, we talk a lot about empathy. Whereas my business students started off talking about profit and I'm like, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's kind of dial this back. You know, I mean, profit is in desirable, but um, I, I want the conversation to, to kind of go in a different direction. So, um, so yeah, I think that we just look at it in different ways and maybe I'll pass it over to someone else on the panel right now. I mean, I think this is a great question and those are great comments and that's part of what I, I think we all need to kind of wrestle with, right? Is as healthcare takes up this way of thinking, what does that look like? How do we optimize it? Who should be involved in that process? And I think one of the things that is most interesting to me, but also most challenging, I think, in the healthcare space is that we do have products, but we also have processes and we have um, physical spaces and we have need for graphic design. So there, there are all these opportunities to use design in healthcare. Um, and, it, and how we do that for products within healthcare might look different than how we do it for physical spaces or for processes or social innovation. So um, I think it's a great question and something that we're gonna have to work together to try to figure out, I think. Yeah, I'll um, tack some a sentence back onto Jack, what Jackie said. Um, I didn't say earlier that right now I, I'm with the Phyllis M. Taylor Center for Social Innovation and Design Thinking, a really long um, name for a center. But because I'm in a, a social innovation space, I probably also now think a little bit differently um, than I did when I was at the College of Design or when I was at the D school. Um, you know, so our lens changes in each space that we're in. Could I jump onto that? I, I, I love the way you said that because that is, that's kind of what I was alluding to by calling out uh, Bond's um, endowed chair and this kind of merged thing. It, it, he actually fully deserves it, but it also is, is an incredibly cool precedent um, to your point, like just creating these centers that are, that are, that have the right like level of, of impact and the right, and this new philosophy and new mindset and way of working, it's, it can really have a huge, huge impact. Like one, my kind of, uh, another response to this in terms of how do you do this? How do you create it? It's um, I was, I've been really, I always give the, there's these two Tim Brown, Harvard Business Review articles that I always use for my students. And what I like, they were written about 10 years apart. And to summarize them, what I always say is that the first one, it's, it's introducing design thinking as a concept. And, it's, and, and, and then the second one is a retrospective. What I love in the second one is he says, um, in the early days of design thinking, um, we were enamored and so excited to use design thinking to create these amazing uh, artifacts you know, a new design, a new experience, a new product. The issue is now that we're, now that design is being asked to take on bigger and bigger things, um, we now are faced with using design thinking to design acceptance of the new artifact. <laughs> because, and I think his point was, 
and it's really well taken. If he's writing right to CEO suites, maybe at first he was writing to the design lab within one. Now he's writing to CEOs. If you don't involve, just like any of the design thinking process, if you don't involve the leadership or whoever you're trying to ultimately make a big level decision and you successfully create a very disruptive new idea for their thing and the first time they hear about it is when you walk in and show them this highly disruptive thing, they're very like, then you're facing, you're giving them a yes, no response as opposed to his point in the article is if they've been involved in the design process, they've seen provocative prototypes along the way. And so it should be the final meeting should actually be hey, you've seen all this before. We're down to these last three concepts. Which one do you think is best? And they choose. So that's a long game, but I think that's actually the right vision. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, Bond, you'd like to uh, jump in? Uh, I don't have too much to add. I, I just want to get those cards. And I, and I love the card about the assimilation and recognizing the dominant culture. And that's something that I've had to work on. And I think a lot of us, in healthcare need to work on because we have these assumptions about what is health, what is wellness. And that's very specific to the individual. And, you know, one criticism I have is a lot of the um, products and services that we're seeing comes out of Silicon Valley of health and wellness. It's an app or something to make the, the rich people healthier. And the patients I see and treat in my emergency room, they're thinking about where can I get my next meal? And, and I, we have these assumptions about health and I think what design can do is to help us tease that out. So I love those uh, cards, I can't, can't wait to get them. I think those questions we need to be asking more in healthcare. Okay, uh, thank you, Bang. So let's the end, congratulations. Probably you read uh, the chat so that's been making a lot of impact, right? People really like it, people are using uh, the car. So yeah, congratulations on the success. So I think this is, uh, uh, yeah, let's the end. Thank you for taking the time to speaking with us. So I think this is the end of the time. I really appreciate again, appreciate everybody's participation. I really learned a lot. I really enjoy all the conversation, all the great questions and the great insights from the, the panel.